Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Adobe Live. My name is Howard Pinsky, Senior XD Evangelist here at Adobe, joined by the one and only Julie Sandusky. How are you, Julie? I'm good. How are you, Howard? I'm doing pretty well. Just realized I forgot to put my glasses on. Oh, That's no. Better. Now I feel complete. I know. I have my glasses somewhere here, too. But <laughs> Let's see. Here they are. Got to have those glasses. Well, while Julie's finding her glasses, a big hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone joining us live on Behance. If you are tuning in, let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from, and more importantly, how you're doing throughout everything that's happening in the world. We've got Jack, Sam, Colby, and Julia in the chat already. Throw your name in there, let us know. How are you, uh, Julie? Doing well. It's nice and sunny out here. That's um, nice. Yeah, let us know in the chat where everyone's from. Yeah, I always, always love seeing people see. from all over the world. We've got Laura also in the chat. Welcome. All right, so before we dive into things, there's a few things we want to cover first. One, we've got portfolio reviews today. So in about an hour and a half, we're going to be taking a look at two portfolios. So if you are tuning in on Behance, behance.net slash Adobe Live, head up to the portfolio review tab at the top right and we will pick two of them towards the end of the stream and take a look. And I guess while people are still shuffling in, Julie, if you wanna introduce yourself, tell everyone who you are and what you do, go yeah. for it. Hey everyone, um, so my name is Julie. I'm gonna zoom in here to give a little intro. Um, so I am a product designer um, and I'm based in Seattle, Washington, but I'm actually nice. on the East Coast right now with some family. Um, so if anyone's from Seattle, let me know in the chat <laughs> or from New York. That's where I am from originally. Um, and uh, a little bit about my background. So I focus on circular design and food. And so what circular design means is focusing on solutions that design out waste from our systems. Um, so this past year, um, I ended in April, but I was an Adobe Creative Resident. And so I spent the year working on designing solutions to reduce food waste and inspire a circular economy. So that's been like my passion and focus and we're doing something similar today. So staying within that realm. Um, and something I like to say, you know, there's a little motto here is that good design is better when it does good for people and planet. Mm. Um, so I focus on purpose-driven design and circular methods and create these experiences that start from the ground up and inspire large-scale change. So I love that. About me. Yeah. Nice. And you mentioned that you were a creative resident at Adobe. How was that experience like? Yeah, I mean, it was really life-changing. Um, so previously, I come from a self-taught background, and so mm -hmm. um, in school, I you know learned design through side projects and hackathons, and um, I ended up working at IDEO for. Um, during school, so I took a semester off to work there and I was working on the future of food, which is exciting. Um, and that's where I learned more about like the UX design process and how important research is and that gave me a really, really strong foundation. And um, yeah, so applying to the residency, I had gone and worked at Microsoft for two years, right when nice. I graduated. And I realized that, hey, I want to be back in design. I want to be full force working on something that I'm passionate about. And that's what brought me to applying to the residency. Um, has anyone in the chat heard of the residency before or seen Yeah, it? I would love to um, hear what the chat thinks. I know it's it, the residency yeah. this year is a little bit different than it has been right. in the past. We, you know, we brought on two amazing residents and what we're also doing because uh, you know, of all the changes that's happening in the world right now, and maybe Sam will post a link to the resident uh, portal and landing yeah. page is we're doing uh, Julie can talk more about this if she wants but we're basically we have a, a ton of money I think it's a million dollars that we're dividing up between people all over the world and they'll be able to apply to tell us about their project and I believe they can receive anywhere from five hundred dollars to a uh, five thousand dollars to complete that project which I think is so cool yeah yeah so the residency last year we had about nine residents and with everything happening this year, Adobe kind of realized like we need to be able to support a lot of artists in a bigger community. Yep. Um, and so that's why they created the fund. So anyone in the chat, if you're interested in learning about the fund and applying with a project, I highly encourage you to do so. <laughs> um, they, you know, it 
everyone here probably is interested in maybe UX. So they have like a whole UX portion, um, but you also can apply as a photographer or a graphic designer or an illustrator. So any community or part of that you think someone would benefit from a program like this, definitely have them apply. Totally, like, yeah. It's not just UI and UX, right? Right, right, yeah. So really anyone in a creative field that uses some Adobe products, um, yeah, they can get funded for their project. So nice. it's kind of a mini residency. It's like a four week residency. Yeah. Um, so it's a cool opportunity. Indeed. So yeah. before we're going to dive over to, to um, what you're going to be doing in a second, I do want to sneak something. So I'm okay. going to switch over to me for a second. And I am on my Twitter account of all places. And I want to scroll down over here because we are going to be releasing an, a pretty big update very soon sometime in june some of you already guessed when that update's coming but i can't confirm just yet but we are going to be releasing a pretty big update in june and one of the features that we did sneak is called stacks and this video here gives you a little bit of an idea of what will be possible when stacks is released so essentially and maybe i'll demo this sometime during the stream but i do want to focus on what julie's going to be doing is you know you'll be able to very quickly rearrange add duplicate delete elements and you really don't have to worry about manually taking over and just that you know the annoying process of moving things around it's just no one wants to deal with that right so as you can see here stacks will solve a lot of that and i've been using it for a little bit and it's gonna it's gonna be a game changer for adobe xd so Get ready for that. Sam just posted the link if you want to see a, a better video of it. But get ready for stacks. Stacks are coming. It's not the only feature that's coming, but I can't talk about those just yet. But we will uh, we'll see those before you know it. All right, Julie. So what do you have planned for the next two days? Yeah. Yeah. Also, just on that note, I'm super excited for those, those updates. <laughs> I can't wait to use that. <laughs> I know. It's going to be great. So stay tuned. Um, I saw in the chat someone is asked if they if a beginner can apply to the program. Um, so it depends. You want to have like a portfolio of work to show. Um, so that can be like side projects and things that you can put in a portfolio. Um, but if you're a beginner, I always just recommend applying, giving it a shot because you know you never know what what could happen so definitely apply um, yeah the worst that will happen is you know adobe says no and exactly. it just forces you to continue building up your portfolio you know on a personal note i've been applying to work at adobe for probably the last 10 years and it's taken yeah. that long to finally land a position wow. i've heard no a lot because either i wasn't qualified or there are no positions available um but you just got to keep trying you got to better your skills you got to better yourself and eventually it will work well i'm so glad they got you howard <laughs> me too you have the most amazing <laughs> website let's xd.com i always recommend that to people if anyone's starting in xd i'm like go to let's xd.com that oh, is thank you. where you need to start <laughs> um Awesome. So yeah, today I'm super excited to be here again. This is my second Adobe Live, my first Adobe Live remote. Um, so the new normal for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so like I mentioned before, I focus a lot on circular design and food and um, something I've been doing a lot lately now that I've been home a lot more often um, has been gardening and um, growing vegetables in my driveway of all places. So in I, your driveway. I need to know yeah, more about this. Yeah, in my driveway. This, and I'll show you a photo. We just got, <laughs> we just moved into a new home not too long ago. And we have a you know, little bit of land in the backyard and we want to start planting things. We have yeah. no idea like what we're supposed How to be to doing. Do it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I live like right 10 minutes to downtown Seattle. And so all of the houses, I live in like a really skinny house. Right. Um, so we don't have a backyard. We literally have just like a patch in, I'm zooming in on this photo, but this is my driveway. Um, oh my gosh. So we just have a patch of grass on either side. And then we have like my driveway here. And so I had wanted to start like a little mini urban farm in my driveway. Mm -hmm. So I built all of these garden boxes and then um we have tomatoes growing in there we have lettuce peas um all the kinds of herbs you could want um and so it's been a lot of fun to get started on that um that's exciting and so 
I had this question in the beginning as I was doing this. I was like, why, how can we enable everyone everywhere to grow their own food? Yep. Um, so this is something that, you know, we talk about local food all the time. Like let's all eat locally, which means like with a, within 180 miles of where you live or 280 miles of where you live. Um, but how can we enable everyone to grow food in their own backyards? Yeah. Um, and I saw this article in the New York Times that I thought was really funny. Um, it's this one right here. When life gives you quarantine, plant potatoes. <laughs> I like it. Um, so it's basically talking about how, um, you know, in forced isolation, people were able to build these community gardens in their backyard and then be able to stay connected, even though they were separated from their neighbors and friends and things like that. Um, and it just brings us closer and closer to the food that we eat every day. Um, yeah, I, I will tell you that since the quarantine started, I've been seeing so many advertisements on Instagram and Facebook for these like super futuristic pods that you can put in your house and grow plants. And I don't know what the deal is with that. I don't know if you've yeah. seen that, but it looks super futuristic and cool, even though I, I don't know what I would do with it. I want to get yeah. one. I don't know why. I mean, that sounds super cool. We had when I was working at Microsoft in the cafeteria, we had kind of like a pod and it was a hydroponic growing system. And so the lettuce that was in the salad bar, a lot of it came from the, that like vertical farming pod that was oh, in the cafeteria. Yeah. Um, I heard a story of someone during quarantine who they didn't have a backyard. So instead they built a whole, I forget who this was too. I cannot figure it out, but they built a whole garden within their living room. So they oh. had like grow lights everywhere. <laughs> And it was just like the funniest thing to read and I've been trying to find that article or whoever told it to me, but alas. Yeah, I would love to um, check that out. Yeah. So um, the concept for this, so when I was starting to um, get into creating this mini micro farm, you could call it, um, I was digging through, you know, so many articles and so many websites and it took me so many hours to be able to find the right information mm -hmm. um and i have a bunch of friends who wanted to do a similar thing and so i ended up talking to them about you know what are your pro like classic designer what are your problems pain points um things like that um doing like a mini research exercise um to try to figure out how we can solve this problem um so the whole goal of the concept that we'll be designing over the next two days is to um help people, you know, build and design and plan a mini micro farm within their driveway, their backyard, um, or your entire living room um, to make it that. an easier process. So, yeah. And, and what thinking, thinking forward, and maybe you're going to cover this in a second, yeah. so I apologize, but what, what are the biggest challenges that you're, I think you think you're going to be facing in a project like this? Yeah. Yeah. So I do have a, a little, oh, okay. Um, let's go over i think it's over here so I'll, i'm gonna jump through the pain points let me mention one more thing sure which um you know a, it's a big a stepping back like why why are urban farms and micro farms and things important um and howard maybe you can relate to this as well but when you grow your own food it like makes you feel way more connected to it and mm. know you know where it comes from and how it's grown and yep. makes you more conscious so when I was working on food waste the last year, the biggest thing that I challenged that I saw when designing solutions was that people just aren't as conscious of how much they need and where it comes from and um, how their food is grown. Yeah. And so I saw this quote by Dan Barber recently, who's a, he's a, um, he owns a restaurant in New York and he's a big farm to table movement um, chef. And he said that if you want the generation to eat responsibly, we have to ignite this consciousness of where our food come from, comes yep. from. And it's coming from the ground up one seat at a time. So basically he's encouraging like kitchen um, farming in order to ignite this consciousness. So that's a little bit of background. And with urban places becoming way more populated, um, more and more we'll see urban farms sprout up. So that's totally. a little bit of background, but yeah, the challenge is. I love that. I love the idea, but I can imagine, yeah. you know, people living in New York in these tiny little apartments right. might be a little bit difficult. Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot of um, rooftop farms happening that are oh. on big apartment buildings in New York, for example. So you can rent like a little plot of 
like a garden bed essentially and grow mm. your own produce and go farm it there so that's, that's something that's like i'm seeing more and more yeah but that's definitely a challenge like the space the space dilemma um yeah. so the biggest pain points that i found um when trying to start your own so we're making the assumption that you have a little bit of space so whether it's right. your driveway or your living room or your balcony whatever it is you have a little bit of space and you want to start growing your own food yep. um so the biggest pain points here is that it's very difficult to get started so you need to do a lot of research and um i ended up having like a notebook full of notes on what plants can go together when they're harvested and things like that um the other thing is that it's very um it has to be personalized to where you're located so what region you're in um and the weather conditions there so howard remind me where you're you're in denver is that right or in colorado? I, I am yeah okay so colorado and seattle maybe not as different but if you're living in florida or somewhere else in the world um you know different weather will require different conditions for those plants to grow. That's true. Um, I, I found that um, with cooking as well. Uh, my yeah. parents come down from Canada quite often. And mm -hmm. because of the different elevation, it's yeah. completely different when you're cooking things like uh, cookies, for example. You have to either cook them longer or you know spread them more apart because it, yeah. it affects everything. And the same goes with planting things. I know. I found, I, I found that so interesting, the altitude difference yeah. with cooking. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, you really have to be conscious of it, like knowing what I feel like I never know what altitude I'm at when I travel. <laughs> yeah, you know, going to a place like Colorado versus elsewhere. So super interesting. But yeah, exactly. So it affects how your plants grow um, and has requires different care instructions and stuff like that. Um, and the last thing is that the main takeaway is that when you make a mistake or something goes wrong in your garden, you don't really realize it until it doesn't produce you know, vegetables. So right. you want to be able to set yourself up and have this like feedback loop um, to be able to understand like what could I have done differently or what should I do in order to take care of this plant so that it actually produces a vegetable. Um, yeah, so those are the main pain points to tackle within a concept like this. And I wrote out a few questions that I was hearing most often um, related and in, in a thing, a research tactic that I recommend to people is go through like online forums. You'll find so much information um, about who your users might be. So things mm -hmm. like Reddit. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but all the time, yeah, um, all the time going through and just finding like what are the patterns. So if you don't have resources to, you know, compensate someone to have a 45 minute interview, you can just use what's online as well. Yep. Um, that'll get you pretty far in that research process. Um, so being able to dig through a big Reddit thread, find uh -huh. what the patterns are, um, and then list those out. That's a good research tactic. Yeah, we, we do that a lot with, um, obviously when we're researching Adobe XD and, and I'm sure you've seen this, people who use design tools are incredibly vocal. Yes. So, you know, there are very large Reddit threads, there are forum posts, there are tweet, Twitter threads, just of mm -hmm. things that people like, people don't like. Some of them are nicer than others, but you know, there's, there's vocal communities in pretty much every single industry. And I'm sure planters are vocal yeah. at some point as well. Maybe not to the level that like, maybe not to the angry level that some other industries are, but y you can definitely find a lot of information by just browsing online. Mm -hmm. I know. I just, I don't think I've found like a full farming forum before, but I can imagine <laughs> like that would be really, really interesting to see like going yeah. through that. Um, I went for this through a lot of like beginner gardener websites and forums like that. And so these are some of the questions that I saw. And honestly, a lot of these questions I had as well when I first started. Um, so things like what time of year is it best to plant certain vegetables? So some obviously need to be planted in the fall, some need to be planted in spring and so on. Um, should you plant seeds directly in the soil or should you start them inside? So a lot of mm. seeds need to be started inside under like a grow light or something um, in order to make sure that they'll actually sprout and not get hurt by really hard rain or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then the biggest thing is which plants can go together. So soil health is super important for growing your own food. Um, and certain 
vegetables require a lot more nutrients. And so if you combine them all together, the soil will just be totally depleted and nothing will grow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, there are what's called companion plants. So if you have broccoli or something, broccoli can is a companion plant with radishes and it's not accurate necessarily, but <laughs> you know, certain vegetables can um, be planted with broccoli to make sure that the soil is, is balanced there. Um, right. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, it's the only, the only thing I know about planting stuff is from Animal Crossing. If you put certain plants near oh, each yes. other, something different will happen. Um, yeah. But that's the extent of it. So I'm, I'm pretty much useless. Yeah. <laughs> I love in Animal Crossing how they have the hybrid, hybrid flowers. Yeah. But yeah. it's like they're making real life. <laughs> um, so let's see a few other things. I won't go through all of them. Um, but how do you troubleshoot a plant not growing? So mm. if there are certain pests in your area, like I found a ton of slugs on my plant the other day oh, no. and I was like, oh my God, and it started eating my lettuce. I'm like, how do I get rid of this? Um, speaking of, there's a great movie called Biggest Little Farm. Hmm. Um, that's a documentary style movie, but it's about a someone, you know, starting a farm without really much experience in California. And it's just a beautiful movie. Um, so do watch it, it if you're interested. Um, and then let's see. Soil having enough nutrients is another one. How can you, how far apart do you have to space your plants? Mm -hmm. That's important in order to make sure that they grow. Um, and then if it rains, do I need to water them? Simple things like that. Right. So those were a bunch of the questions that I was seeing. Um, and another thing that I like to do, I'm going to hop back over here. So whenever I'm working on a concept and I come up with a general idea of what I'm going to do, I always go out and I look for who's out there. What are they doing? Um, like, are there any apps or any solutions that exist that are already trying to solve this problem? Right. Um, and that helps me, it, it adds on to the research that I was doing. So not only do I go through all of those forums before I come up with a concept or um, try to get more information, but I go through reviews of solutions that are out there. So especially if it's in the app store already, something like that, you can just check out the reviews and read through them. A lot of the times people who comment on those are like, the app's not working and it crashes, mm -hmm. which that doesn't really help your research, but sometimes you'll find some really interesting tidbits of insights in there. Um, yeah, I often so, see when I'm browsing reviews, you know, I love this app. However, I would like to see X, Y, and Z to make it even better. Or I completely hate the app and you should, you know, cr develop it this way. Um, yeah. And if enough people say those certain things, then that should be something you should probably take note of and right. apply that to your design. Exactly. Yeah. So you can, you can definitely figure out some feature prioritization as well, just within reviewing other people's apps that they've created already. Yeah, we do um, have a question in the chat from yeah. Synthil. It's a pretty big yeah. question, but can you explain me about product design? Okay. So there's a lot of terms. I know, Howard, you can relate the, to this, but there's a lot of terms out there like UX designer, UI designer, mm -hmm. interaction designer, product designer. <laughs> um, so I can tell you right now, there's not one definition. Um, so what I... and I'll add on your your definition too, Howard. Um, but a product designer is someone who designs products, obviously, but more so designs the way that we interact with things. So, um, you know, with UX, it's how can we create seamless experiences to get people to achieve task A and task B. Yep. Um, and with product designer, it, to me, it encompasses not only digital designs, but also physical products. Um, so it really is mostly about designing the interactions that we as humans have with the products that we use. If that makes sense. I love sense. it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There's so many different titles out there and they're just yeah. getting, I don't want to say the, I don't want to say worse, but they're just getting, they're, more titles are just being piled on to our industry yep. and it's hard to really differentiate what each one does. But I yeah. think product designer is a good one because it's pretty straightforward. But you yeah. also have a, a lot of different like UI interactive designer and you have all these other things that are just super confusing. But product yeah. designer, great title. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's funny too because I think, um, you know, previously I was like UI UX designer was more of a thing. Not, it's still more, it's still a thing, but like it was 
more common than I see now, actually. Yeah. Um, but I think what happened there was that people realized that they really go hand in hand, like having UI experience with um, visual design as well as experience design kind of meshing together to what a product designer is. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to see like which terms develop more and how they're used in the industry. Yeah, totally. And if anyone else has questions for Julie throughout her stream, definitely throw them in the chat. I'm taking a look and I believe you're taking a peek from time to time at chat as well. I am, yeah. Nice. Just so whenever I look to the corner and that's when me on the chat. So feel free oh, to ask so questions. And Julia is in the chat and she says she studied product design in Germany and I was never interfered with wireframes at all. Wow. It was all, it was 3D, all 3D industrial design. That's interesting. So that, you know, the yeah. product, the, the title could completely, can be completely different based on the country you're in. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah, I know. That's why it's like, you really always have to ask, like, what do you do specifically? Yeah. Um, whenever there's a title within design. <laughs> so you understand. Um, oh, Howard, happy marriage anniversary. Thank you. 11 years. <laughs> Wow, congratulations. That's Thank you. Exciting. It's gone by so quickly. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, go out and celebrate when quarantine is over. Yeah, really. <laughs> and at home. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. Where were we? So we were looking at um, a couple different apps that are out there that are focused on... Right now, it's just gardening. Um, right. But I'm specifically focusing on like urban farming, so farming food. Um, so a couple apps that are out there, I'll go through them really quick. Um, so Garden Plan Pro is a an app that you have to pay for, which okay. a lot of people don't pay for apps anymore. So that's true. Yeah, um, but I guess this must be useful. Yeah, so, the App Store really uh, changed a lot. You know, I remember yeah. the days where. Things like the Creative Cloud, for example, if you wanted to buy the entire suite, it was like $2,000 or something. And, mm -hmm. you know, games, $60 a pop, even though, yeah. you know, many of them are still that. But you go to yeah. the App Store and it's a ton of free stuff. But then there's micro interaction or micro <laughs> interactions, micro transactions, and there's um, subscriptions. There's a lot, it just yeah. changed completely. And a lot of people, because of that, don't want to pay for anything these days. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I feel the same way. Whenever I'm like, there's an app that I have to pay for, I really need to figure out if I'm going to like it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I'll actually get value out of it. Even if it's, you know, the cost of a coffee. It's so it's so weird how how much that affects like our willingness to to get an app these days. Yeah, um, and, and sometimes you don't even know if what you're buying is going to work. You know, I'm just thinking yeah. to an app I purchased recently, we just got a Peloton not too long ago, and mm -hmm. it doesn't interact, it doesn't interface well with the Apple Watch, but there okay. is an application that you can download that will. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was like $10 or something like that. And some people yeah. say it worked, some people say it didn't work. And you don't really know unless you buy it and try it because there's right. oftentimes not a demo available. You can't just try it for a few hours and see if it works and then give it back if it doesn't yeah yeah so people really have to get creative these days with you know from the business side of things let's assume all the apps are free because that's how people will download it how can yep. i then make money within that app so that's where things like subscriptions and other little tactics like pro features and stuff comes into play so yeah but yeah it's interesting to see that like cultural shift into mm -hmm. the subscription model. i wonder where it's going to go next yeah that's actually a, a big thing with the circular economy so um leaning more towards a subscription-based society. So where yeah. we don't own things, but rather we're like renting them. Right. Um, it's actually way more environmentally friendly. Not, I mean, I'm talking more about physical products than like digital. Yep. Um, but digital kind of, it can apply to. Um, but yeah, that's hopefully we'll see more of a shift to that model within all of society. So even things so. like, like Uber sharing cars, um, Airbnb sharing, space that's not being used yeah so, yeah it's super i just want to get away from microtransactions. i think those are so bad for the the industry especially when yeah. you know kids are involved i there was there have been so many stories where kids have just grabbed you know, their parents phone or the parents gave them an ipad with a bunch of yeah. games on them and this yeah. was probably back before all these restrictions were put into place but they just racked up thousands and thousands of dollars in these oh microtransactions God. because the kids don't know any better. They see this little pop-up come up and you want more uh, diamonds or whatever the in-game currency is. They press, yes, I want more. I want 500 more. They don't know what they're spending. 
Um, yeah. It's just, it's sometimes it gets very toxic. I know. Yeah, there really needs to be barriers <laughs> for yeah. that to not happen. Yeah. Um, but hopefully we'll see less of that, the microtransaction stuff. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this app, one thing that I wanted to call out within here, so it has a planner. So basically you're able to, if you look over here on the left side, um, this left screen right here, you can see that someone's basically making like a visual plan of what their garden looks like. Um, and then they click through and they can see that specific plant um, and then they can get advice on how to take care of that plant. Mm -hmm. um, so the pros with this app, um, based on looking at it and digging through those reviews, is that it has a customizable planner. So I can fully create my own customized garden. Yep. Um, there's note taking. So a lot of people would um, take notes on how that plant is progressing throughout the the time that, you know, since they started planting it. Yep. Um, and then there's an extensive crop selection. So they have a huge database of plants and veggies um, that people will, you can choose from and learn care instructions about. You know, just looking at that uh, customized, customizable planner screenshot, mm -hmm. Stacks, which is coming soon, is going to yeah. make that process so much easier. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. I know. I really want to incorporate that <laughs> into this sometime soon. So maybe mm -hmm. I'll do that. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that I've come into that situation so many times where I've wanted stacks and I'm like, I can't wait for stacks to come. Yep. Um, so soon. I'm super excited to have that soon. Um, so the cons with this, it's an expensive app. By expensive, I mean, it's like $8. Um, but like we were talking about before, that's a big barrier um, right. to entry. Um, so there's no tracking capabilities. So keeping people, we're just using notes to keep track of the plant's progression. And then there's kind of a complicated UX. If you look in here, there's a lot going on. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a little bit outdated as well. So just some of the things like these harsh borders and colors and icons and things like that. So there's some some stuff we can do there. Looks like an old school version of Microsoft Excel or something. It does, right? I was gonna say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it has a lot, of, a lot of room to grow. <laughs> mm -hmm. No pun um, intended. So the next one is something called gardeners.com and that has, um, it's all free and it's only web-based. So okay. it has a similar model where you can customize like a garden bed and things like that. Um, and it's free, pre-made garden plans. So if you, you know, want to focus on leafy greens, they have one pre-made for you. So it already does all the work. Hmm. Um, the cons is that there's no mobile app. It's a little bit outdated as well and there is a limited selection of vegetables. In this last one, kind of similar. It's funny, they all have the same like color green. <laughs> I've noticed that, yeah, it's if interesting. You notice. I know, um, it's and super And, and if I'm being very honest, I'm not a huge fan of yeah. any of them. It's like a very washed out yellowish, greenish, brownish. Mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. I would love to see an app like this, but with some fun bright greens and bright yellows mm -hmm. and a little bit of browns and oranges. Yep. Well, hopefully we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll throw that in for the visual part. Um, yeah. I, and I wonder though, if that green, you know, I always want to check the accessibility of colors too. So I wonder if maybe that was a thought of a lot in this, because sometimes the lighter, oh, if you've seen with like the lighter shade of green and the lighter shade of red, that's really good for accessibility reasons, but yep. not super sure. You'd have to check that. Um, yeah, so this one, it's an exp inexpensive app. There are weekly to-dos. So it tells you, you know, this week you have to take care of this plant and this plant and this plant. Um, you should move this plant from inside to outside, things like that. So it goes through. But you also have to pay up front. So like we were talking about before, you don't know what you're going to get with the app yeah. until you buy it. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah, so um, going through all of those. Um, so someone asked in the chat, um which application is best for ux designers so i think what they mean is which design application but i'm not super positive so central again um mm -hmm. but right now we're using adobe xd and it's definitely my favorite and howard i assume it's your favorite too um, I would hope so. <laughs> and it's a great you know it's a prototyping software so i honestly do everything in xd even like pitch decks and presentations um, yeah. but it's a really quick way to design screens. Um, so it's a great tool to check out. So yeah. Can... And if there are any specific features that 
you'd like to see in XD, specifically thinking about UX design, definitely let us know, adobexd.uservoice.com. There's also a lot of plugins that can help with that. Specifically, yeah. there is a plugin called Mockup. No, it's called uh, Whiteboard. Um, it's made by one of the teams at Adobe, and they also are in the process of releasing a new plugin called Quick Mockup, and that will allow you to create very quick templates and uh, you know just block out elements, very bare bones, and then you can add themes to it, which is super cool as well. So there's there's a lot of really interesting plugins that will help with that process. Yeah. Um, in addition to what's built into XT, and I do see um, Sumon in the chat is asking he said i learned xd from my tutorials thank you very much uh the problem have no experience with photoshop illustrator and color how do you improve and it's an interesting question i think you know one you're in a good spot right now you're watching julie throughout the stream you're going to learn a lot and throughout adobe live we do have streams on photoshop and photography illustration in illustrator and many of the guests and the host talk about color theory and the process, why they're designing a certain way, how they get to the end result. Mm -hmm. And honestly, there's there's a ton of free tutorials on YouTube as well. I mean, it's, it sounds like you've probably watched a few of them. Continue doing that, continue practicing. One thing I love to do, because I'm still learning, I'm, I'm always learning, I'll never stop learning, is I'll go on Behance, I'll go on Dribble, and I'll just look at some of the most appreciated projects find things that are really striking that maybe I can't necessarily do at the moment and try to recreate those. You know, try to um, figure out why the certain colors were used. Maybe it's for accessibility reasons or maybe it helps pop out a color from the background. There's a lot you can do there, especially when you're recreating something. I found that helps tremendously. Yeah. Yeah, another thing I would recommend is Adobe has a lot of blog content as well, so XD hmm. Ideas. Yep. Um, they have probably articles on typography and imagery and all the things like that. That's a great spot to go check out. Um, you know, coming from like a self-taught background too, like you can do it and keep learning. Um, and just we have, there's so many resources online for you to get started. And I always recommend like learn by doing. So yeah. go any problem that you're interested in trying to solve, just start sketching. Um, and look for inspiration, like Howard said, online. Um, Dribble and Behance is a great place to start. Um, and you'll really find a lot of information and you'll grow that skill as you as you flex that muscle. Um, and on color, I love playing with color. <laughs> um, Howard, I know you do too in a lot of your designs. Mm -hmm. um, this is some of my past work. I'll zoom in here. But I use a lot of bright colors. Yeah. <laughs> which which I have a lot of fun with in designs. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a bright orange, but yeah, I just, I always find that it, it just brings life to des the design and character. Um, yeah, it makes us happy. Yeah, it makes you happy. And honestly, uh, going back to what Sumon was asking about, I don't know if he's still here, uh, I haven't seen him respond, but a lot of the designs that I've been doing these days with the bright, flashy colors right. came from, was were inspired by Andrea Hawk, a previous yeah. creative, creative resident. She does a lot of daily creative challenges and she is amazing with color. Right. She just uses the right colors in the right place, the right tones. And I got a lot of inspiration from her, which yeah. I've been applying to my project. So just keep watching people get inspiration from uh, websites and keep moving forward. Yeah, and you can always pull in like a design from online and then you can color pick those colors and put them together and see how yeah. they work. Um, that's a great way to like test different color palettes. People yep. who have, you know, there are some um, color picker websites out there too where you input one color, it'll give you suggestions for what other colors would go alongside it. So. Yeah, color.adobe.com I think is, is one of those. There you go, perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, okay. So the next thing I like to do after going through, this is kind of a mini condensed version of research, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I like to go and create a mood board. Um, so with this topic, something that I thought of was, I've seen this in the grocery store sometimes, but the Farmer's Almanac, have you ever seen that, Howard? I don't think so. Okay, so it's basically, it's been running since 1792, um, mm. but it's a little publication about like weather predictions um, based on different locations. And um, it's still in print today, which I think is awesome. Oh my gosh. 
Um, yeah. And I don't know, I just, I, I love that, that concept of being so old and still existing today and still being printed. Um, yeah. So I pulled in a couple like modern takes on the farmer's almanac. Um, and then we have some urban farming going on in here. Then I also pulled a couple designs that I saw online that I really liked the aesthetic of, um, mm -hmm. and they're related to plants too. So just really simple, um, you know, some bright colors in there as well to bring people yep. in. And then this one over here. Ooh, that's fancy. Yeah. So uh, something that I, when I was, you know, thinking about this concept, I was like, it would be awesome to be able to, which we'll do this tomorrow, um, to use auto animate to have a plant like grow. Right. Over time and be able to see that progression. Um, so we'll pull in an illustration tomorrow and be able to prototype that um, using auto animate. So I was inspired by this one um, and wanted to make that kind of interaction. Yeah, that should be really interesting. Auto animate can do some really cool things. And yeah. especially when you start combining auto animate with masks, which I would assume you would probably need to do for something like this, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, you can get some really interesting results. Yeah. Yeah, I love playing with loading screens, if you've yeah. ever done that. Um, so whenever there's a loading screen, you know, you can just have a circle that spins, but why don't you have like an illustration that does something fun? Um, mm -hmm. Something I love is on Google, if you if your internet is down, you'll have the little game. Have you ever seen yeah, that? Yeah, the little dinosaur guy. Little dinosaur, and you like play a game as it's loading, and it's just yeah. a great, it's a great use of time. Um, so yeah, so mood boarding is, is a thing you can do. I normally go to Pinterest to pull in photos into a mood board. Um, mm -hmm. you can really go anywhere. It's just there to inspire you and, um, you know, try to create like a, an aesthetic of what you're looking for in your design. Um, so that's like a great, a great place to start, um, for mood boarding. So something I wanted to ask the chat is, where do you get your icons? So does anyone have any icon kits that they're super into? Cause I've been trying to find like my favorite and I still can't find one. Um, that's like, I want to use all the time. So if you have any, let me know in the chat. Yeah, I'm right, a big fan of icons. Um, unfortunately, I can't use most of the ones that I've purchased in many of the projects because many of the things I do for work, I end up distributing publicly for free and many of those icons you know they, they don't allow you to do that but i use the icons for design plugin in xd but uh, the the ones i have purchased i think are streamline icons yep. and what was the there's another big pack that i purchased as well and i have them all loaded into nucleo yeah yeah so i actually pulled in the free version i haven't bought the streamline full pack but yeah. this is just the free i threw some icons at the bottom there too but this is the free version of the Streamline pack. So I think it's yeah. just streamlineicons.com or something like that. Something like that. Um, but these I found were really, really clean and nice. So mm -hmm. I might have to go buy the full one. I know. Uh, it's so tempting. Yeah, it's really tempting. Icons are really fun. Um, or you can create your own icons. So That's you can true. make those in with the point tool. It just takes a little more time, obviously. Yep. Um, another thing I use is the Noun Project. Have oh, you yeah. used that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like you said, it's important to make sure that the license that you get with those icons you can use for what you're building. So if you're designing a product for a client, let's say you're a freelancer, like you need to make sure you have the right license to be able to use that um, for a client project. So just yeah. a, a tip for all the new designers out there. Yeah, because sure many of the free icons, the open source, well, not open source, but many of the free icon packs uh, don't allow you to use them for commercial purposes, but you can use them for personal purposes. There are also some open source libraries that allow it, basically like Creative Commons, where you can use it for whatever you want. Then, of course, there are paid icons, and those usually come with commercial licenses. So, yeah, like Julie said, be very careful when you are yeah. designing for commercial purposes. Yeah, and it's the same with like photos as well. So, um, when you're just getting started, you might think like, oh, I could just pull in an image from online, but make sure that you have the right license to use that photo. Mm -hmm. So something that you can use like Adobe Stock is great. I'll pull that up really quick. Um, so I use that a lot for getting stock images. They have like millions, I wanna say, um, within there. So here is an example. So I made a little, oh, I have to sign in, I will. 
2019. So you can explore different categories and see um, stock images that are available. And then yep. you can get, I think when you sign up with Creative Cloud, you get 10, a free trial for a month where you get 10 yeah. standard assets. Um, and then afterwards you pay um, per month for those assets. So this is a great spot to get stock photos. You can also use like Unsplash is another website. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of them out there. So just make sure to check out those photos too. Yeah, so someone definitely. had asked in the chat um, about reading case studies. So, um, and whether that's good for getting UX knowledge. Um, I love reading case studies. I think they're really fun. Behance, I feel like has created this case study format that's really, really good for UX design, especially for a portfolio yep. piece. Um, so it's a great way to understand like what information um, do I need to have to be able to, you know, walk through how I design this project. So often people start with, you know, what is the big problem that you're trying to solve? What's the concept that you came up with? How did you get to that concept? So like the research that you did um and then the actual designs the decisions that you made within those designs so i highly recommend reading case studies um they're a great way to to learn about what that process looks like fully i agree and, and those are definitely some of the best uh posts on behance so the ones that really outline the start to finish project and you know think websites like dribble are great yeah. but the, you don't typically see the reasoning behind a project why you you know how you got to the final result you just see this really nice looking shot but on behance you have a lot more space to really dive into everything about the project and if, if you are you know starting off with behance or starting off in the ui and ux world i would really encourage you to make case, very in-depth case studies like julie mentioned you know how you started the process show your sketches show your colors and character styles and talk about why you use certain colors and character styles as well it just yeah, especially if you want to get clients clients love that stuff yeah i'm gonna pull up my fellow creative resident patricia yeah she was in the chat earlier i think oh yeah amazing um so she does an amazing job with case studies um, and she's actually, I think, going to be teaching an online course about them sometime soon. So Ooh. check her out um, and see, you know, follow along for that. So I'll pull up a case study just so you can see really quick. Um, let's go through this cooking one. So, um, you know, she's a bunch of them as well. There are a lot on Behance that go through full case studies, but this is just an idea of what it looks like. Um, so she talks about you know, what the product is doing in the very beginning. So it gives you a snapshot of what she's designing within here. Yep. Um, and then she goes through an overview. So what her role was, the task, the goal, and so on. Then the research piece of it. So user flow mapping. Um, so wireframe, that plugin that you mentioned before, Howard, um, that has a lot of frameworks for doing research and user journey maps and things like mm -hmm. that. So that's a great place to start actually for um, building a case study too. Yeah. Um, so problems in here and, you know, pain points and stuff like that. So that's an example of a case study, but I highly recommend, yeah, check them out and get Yeah, that, that looked really nice. And I know a lot of newer designers are always afraid to create a post that has a lot of information that requires people to scroll, which is why I often see these pages with so much information in you know in, in a viewport and it's just all squeezed in and yeah. i know it's difficult and i know your instinct is just to get as much information in someone's eyes as possible but often it causes the opposite reaction where someone sees all this information squeezed in and they're like oh, i can't deal with this it's just too much so let your information breathe if someone's interested in the project which you're probably going to kick off with a nice header image at the top and like Patricia had at the very top that nice big bold statement then yeah. they're going to scroll if they're interested so yeah don't be afraid just let it all breathe yeah and exactly your point like people can dig in more and actually contact you to learn more about that project yeah so don't feel like you need to throw everything out there and explain every decision that you made um as designers too we have to design the way it's going to be read, you know, yep. um, and perceived. And so it's important to condense that information and get your point out in as few words as possible. Um, oh. So yeah, okay, jumping back in here. So I, you know, over the past few days have laid out kind of an overview of what we'll be going through. So 
by tomorrow, um, we'll be in a much higher fidelity spot and we'll mm -hmm. go through more, you know, in-depth prototyping with AutoAnimate. Um, but today I wanted to focus, I wanted to go through kind of the whole experience and what we'll be designing. Um, and then I'll also begin prototyping um, that first onboarding phase. And if we have time, we'll get to a couple other screens within there. Um, but we'll be throwing in, so right now we're at like a medium fidelity um, wireframe. Mm -hmm. um, so I've added a little bit of typography in here and um, just some placeholder for images and illustrations. And then tomorrow we'll plug in some of those images and illustrations to bring okay. it to life. And, and what typeface are you using? It looks like, an, yeah. it looks like um, if I can see properly, it looks like possibly a serif font. Yes. So Ooh. I was looking for fonts um over the last couple days and so i found freight display pro okay so i love these like big kind of bulky serif fonts i've used yeah. them in a lot of my designs before um so i didn't want to use the same one but i found one that's similar um and one that i also like is circular standard so adobe fonts um if you just if you're you know subscribed to creative cloud you get access to adobe fonts yep and that's has thousands of different um fonts within there that you can pull into your designs um, one thing that I recommend, I don't know, Howard, where you go for your type inspiration, but I use a website called TypeWolf. Um, oh. Have you heard of that one before? I have not. I, and, and I'm a terrible designer. I typically don't uh, go to places for type inspiration. I, okay. I just go to Adobe Fonts and they have that little section that you can put yep. in what your word is going to be and it kind of gives you a preview. And I yep. just kind of wing it. But a yeah. service like this looks pretty cool. That works. Um, so this is, it's, they provide like sites of the day. So every day he'll put up a new site um, with inspiration of different font combinations. Hmm. So I, they have a, a focus on this website um, on like Adobe fonts that are available. So if I click on this one, for example, you'll see the site and then um, sometimes you'll be able to see, hold on, I'll have to find the exact font recommendations, I think. There's one on like Adobe fonts in here somewhere. There we go. So there's a favorites list. So oh, um, interesting. here are 40 best fonts available on Adobe fonts, formerly type kit. Um, and you can just go check that out. It'll link you to that font on Adobe fonts. And then you can just quickly activate it and pull it into your designs. So that's something I love to use. It's a great website. A lot of really, really cool content. Stranger um, but things. I, Howard, I do the same thing too with the Adobe fonts where I just type in the word and see how it looks and then try yep. to match it up. Yeah, so you're not wrong in doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I am using right now um, for this header, I'm using Freight Display Pro and then for okay. my body. So. I was kind of going back and forth between using circular standard and then I had actually seen this on your live stream, Howard, but the Apple font. Oh, the San Francisco one. So I have this one, Apple system UI. I don't know if oh. that's the same as San Francisco or not. Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't think it's the same. I think it's a bit different. A bit different, but I really like how easy it is to read. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of going back and forth because this one's a little bit bulkier, it feels. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, let me know in the chat which one you prefer. This one, the top circular standard one, or the Apple UI font. Totally. And as Sam has reminded everyone, we have about an hour until portfolio reviews. Actually, less, half, but half an hour until portfolio reviews. So make sure to click the portfolio review tab and submit it in there. Awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> we get to review two today? Yes. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, get your portfolios in there. Okay. So... Yeah, so when I start wireframing, it does not look like this. It's literally like boxes and mm -hmm. sketches. And, you know, I just like to then get to the next stage where I add just some gray. It helps me visualize what it's going to look like. Um, so that's when I throw in type and start playing around with that. But this could totally change by the end. Um, but I just recommend like get started, throw it in some visual elements because it'll help pull it all together. Um, so I'm going to just go through a quick overview of the flow of what we're going to be um, doing today and tomorrow. So sure. to start, we have onboarding. 
So um, for this design, there's a couple things that are important. We want to know where the user is located. Yep. Um, and I also wanted to have a voice assistant in there. So since we have voice prototyping in Adobe XD, which you should all check out, which we'll go mm-hmm. through. Um, I wanted to have a voice assistant. So, you know, when you're gardening and your hands are all dirty, you can just like talk to the prototype um, and well, future product. And then, um, you know, it'll just repeat back to you an answer. You know, I didn't even think about that. That's that's incredibly smart because yeah, yeah, like you mentioned, your hands are usually pretty dirty when you're gardening and they're in dirt and you have shovels all over the place. Yeah, and you know, grabbing a phone is probably not what you want to do and start swiping through with this these yeah. dirty hands. So that, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, and honestly, so I actually have inspiration that I got for that voice prototype. Um, so if anyone's used Masterclass before, um, I just had a friend who got a subscription and um, there's this guy named Ron Finley and he teaches gardening. So I watched oh, his video on composting and I was like, oh, I wish he could just like be in this app and be talking to me um (laughs) through the process so that he gave me a little inspiration for um having a voice assistant on the prototype nice thank you ron Uh, yeah thanks ron great great gardener um (laughs) he actually does urban gardens so okay very on theme um so we do onboarding so enabling location enabling your microphone so you can have um, that voice feedback there um, and then getting started. So let's look in here. Okay. So something I usually do um, when I'm, you know, creating a flow is I go through like what are the main screens. So right. things that I I put these little artboards that are just titles basically for what I'm going to be designing within that portion. Um, but I just like to start with the navigation. So what's going to be in this navigation? What are the different touch points that they have to go to? Because mm-hmm. um, those will each be their own kind of experience. And then you'll have to figure out how they all wire together. Yeah. Um, so if I'm looking at this navigation bar, so I wanted to have the voice be kind of the home portion of the design. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And then, so that's where I'll go through it a little bit, but we'll have the voice assistant, but then we'll also have like kind of a learn and discover portion. Um, So things like Ron's video about composting could be in there um, and other apps within there. And how much of this decision was driven by user research? research? Because I would imagine, you know, this is very different. You know, most applications don't have voice as the the initial screen that you see. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it in talking to you know a bunch of people over the last couple of weeks about this concept because I had thought about this quite a, a bit ago when I was starting my garden um so like we had talked about you know when your hands are dirty and you don't want to touch your phone like if you're able yeah. to just talk to and from and get that information that you need because when you're planting you're like oh shoot should I can I move this plant is it ready to harvest I don't know then you have to go wash your hands and things like that um, but yeah, you're right. I haven't really seen voice be the home screen of a an app before. I'm trying to think of of an example, but um, yeah, it was it was basically like how can we make that be the center of this experience and bring it home? So you always have someone to kind of rely on for the information on how to create your urban farm. Makes sense. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Um, the other main thing, so having a guide. And what this is, is it's a um, planting guide specific to that month and the region that you're in. So for example, um, we're in June. So it would be your June planting guide for Seattle, for example. Right. Um, And you can kind of switch back and forth between July, August, September, and backwards if you'd like. Um, And then plots. So what a plot is, it's, you know, kind of the space that you'll be planting in. So you can have um, different garden bends within that space. Um, so for example, for me, it'll be my driveway. I'll have a driveway. <laughs> um, for others, it could be your backyard, it could mm-hmm. be your balcony, things like that. Um, and the last thing was a calendar. So this is important for harvesting, being able to see, okay, these are all of the plants that I have um, within my urban farm. And this is the general like overview calendar of when I need to plant those seeds when I can harvest them. Um, just gives you like a visual indicator. So what Definitely. that looks like, I don't know if I have an example here. It's like this, it's an example of a harvest calendar. 
Okay. So um, I'm just zooming it in here. So if you see all of these boxes, it shows that um, the sow, plant, and harvest times. So February to March, April, May. Um, so I just wanted to have that visual for people who are very inter are interested. Yeah. In and what did the different colors mean? I, I see there's blue and orange and green yeah. on there. Yeah. So um, the blue in this. Yeah, and I'll probably have a similar thing in here too, but the blue is supposed to be um, sowing the seeds. So um, when should I be planting those seeds, for example, inside? Right. Um, and then the green is like the time frame from when you actually transfer those plants and plant them in the soil. And then the orange is when you actually harvest those plants. So obviously it's a range because you can plant them within that range of time and you also can harvest them within that range of time. Got it. it just depends on your plants specifically. So that's what that means. But I actually, um, when I was thinking of, we'll probably go through the calendar tomorrow, but um, when I was thinking of this being a mobile design and having a table like that, um, you know, I was trying to figure out like, how do I get all of that information within one mobile screen? And I found this really cool Medium article um, that talks about like responsive table design for mobile. And so I can show you that tomorrow, but it's kind of some cool ideas that we could probably play around mm -hmm. with. Okay, so we have here creating a garden plot, so creating a thing like dri your driveway, um, and then we'll have like an, an experience for um, creating a planter within that garden plot. Nice. And then here is like an overview of that plot. So driveway farm, you have six different box or yeah, six different boxes in here, and then. Um, <coughs> Something I wanted to do was when you select a box, um, there's going to be a graphic in here, which I'll, I'll pull in in there. But when you select it, you'll see whatever that plant is pop up at the bottom. And if it's an empty box, we'll go to this next screen, which will show that you can plant something and then that'll bring you to the guide. Okay. So the way it all can, it all connects together, like every single, um, I guess, point of the, the navigation bar. Um, but it'll have like different different pieces. So let's see. We'll have the voice assistant. I can definitely see how repeat grids can come into this, especially when you're yep. designing yep. the plots and, and things like that. Exactly. And in the future, we'll have stacks <laughs> work well for that. Um, so this voice assistant piece. Um, so this is kind of that home screen. So if you can see, I have like a learn portion at the bottom here that you can scroll oh, yeah. down into different content. And then you have your planting guide. So these are those companion plants that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And then this is a plant profile. So I wanted to ask the chat, which we can go through this a little later, but I created two different examples of, of wireframes for those. Um, and we can kind of A-B test and see who likes them better. But let's yeah. get started with the onboarding piece. All right. And Suman is asking, <laughs> can we make story like story type comics with Adobe XD. I would assume so. So, I mean, XD wouldn't be the perfect application to design or actually create the illustrations. You'd probably do that in either Fresco or Illustrator or even Photoshop. But once you do that, then you can definitely bring them into Adobe XD to create those, you know, boxes that you see often in comics. You can also do the uh, speech bubbles and things like that, some of the vector effects. But you could if you want to. It's probably not yeah. the ideal application, but you can also use components and states to actually create the templates, depending on you know the different pages. You can have four boxes going across or three boxes or whatever it might be, and you can just select whichever state that you need. So you, you could do something similar to that. Yeah, something I love doing too, which Simon you can play with, is um, you know After Effects might be a better solution for this, but um, with XD, if it's in a vector image, meaning that you have um, access to the different points within there, you can actually animate those characters yeah. as they go. Um, it takes a little bit of time, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and I've played with that a lot within within my design. So check that out. Yeah, you can definitely get pretty creative with XD. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's start with prototyping a little bit. So I have um, this first intro screen, which a plugin that I use whenever I want to have placeholder text is called Lorem Ipsum. So mm -hmm. if I pull up the plugin panel over here, um, you can go in and you know click the plus icon and find this plugin. But if you click Lorem Ipsum and just create a text box and then say 
fill with placeholder text, it'll just add text within there. So that when you're ready to have copy, um, you know, later on in your designs, you can just go replace it. But it's a good way to visually see um, what your prototype's gonna look like. Yeah, and also and, it's not a plug in the next D, but there's veggieipsum.com. And hipster ipsum, have you seen yes. that one? Yeah. Wait, veggie ipsum I have not heard of, but it yeah, sounds- Yeah, veggie ipsum, I'm gonna post it in the chat just because it's it's so interesting. Is it like vegetable names or something? It, 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 it kind of is. Yeah, there's like tomatoes and melons and beans and garlic. It's basically oh Laura Missim, but with a bunch I of veggie names. I need to use that for this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe I'll switch it up for tomorrow. Um, so we have some placeholder text here, but I like, you know, whenever I have a header um, within a screen, I like it to be fun and playful. So yeah. more conversational than like, let's get started. Um, so for this one, it's let's get grow go growing. Um, so this is just your intro screen about the app. I'll throw in a little illustration in here as well. So I laid out four different screens. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a fourth little dot here. Um, and what these dots do is it shows the progression within the onboarding so that you have an idea of how far you are within that. Yep. Um, so if I make that a component, I can start with, let's add some color while we're here. I'll start with this first screen. I'm gonna just delete these guys and then throw them in. So when you copy anything and I just click on the next artboard, it'll keep the same um, spot within that artboard. Yeah, and if you're really in cool. prototype mode and you copy and paste something, if it is wired up, it'll also keep those same prototype the wires as well. Yep. Um, so I'm gonna change that we're on the second screen. This one we're on the third. And now we are done. Okay, so that just shows the progression. So um, for these ones, you also, what I could have done too, is I could have just made different um, states. So an alternative to doing this is I can create, if I go to the right panel here and create, there's a default state, but I can create a second state that's, you know, second screen. Um, and then I can just update the button to the little circle. Um, yeah. And then I can just like tab back and forth. So that's something you can do as well. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever's fastest in the moment. Yeah, for, for things like that, it probably comes down to personal preference. Exactly, um, yeah. Using states in that case probably won't be a massive benefit, but exactly. you can yeah. do it. You can do it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this one, so buttons like these, I'll probably reuse a lot throughout my designs. Um, so I'll go ahead and make that a component as well um, and then update we can start throwing some visual elements but i'm going to create a selected state and yeah then I'm it's always create... good to start your start making your components as early as possible because yes. the last thing you want to deal with is you have like 40 different artboards and then you yeah. decide you want to change the button on all 40 artboards to something else and it's not a component it's just a pain yeah, it is a pain. Definitely. I always like when I'm designing my first screen, I just make most things a component um, yeah. because then it just makes it so much easier. You can always um, reset to a default component um, mm -hmm. or the master state. And yeah, I just, yeah, definitely the, the way to go. Now, here's a question I for you. I, I was, hard way, for sure. yeah, absolutely. We all have. We all um, have. I had a conversation with Kevin on the last stream about this. Mm -hmm. it, you know, when you're designing, because it seems like you start pretty bare bones, you start with wireframes and just gray boxes. When you're yeah. designing that early, do you start creating components at that stage or do you wait until you start defining some of the high fidelity designs before creating the components? Um, it depends. I think when I'm at when I'm at this stage, like when I'm very early on with um, just like very bare bones, you know, boxes and lines, I don't yep. create components. Um, but when I'm getting to a point where you know I have some of those visual elements incorporated, I do start creating components. Um, okay. Especially things like a navigation bar that I know is going to be there, um, and things like buttons too, because then like if I decide that throughout the whole design, I want to have like 
square buttons rather than circular, I can just go change that in the master component. So yep, what about totally. you? What do you do primarily? Uh, it depends on the project, but often I will start creating the components uh, in the wireframing phase, just because mm -hmm. sometimes I do decide to update the the design across the wireframe, even though it's just a wireframe. Sometimes yeah. it, it does help to have rounded buttons, like you said, or square buttons. Um, and if I'm working with a client, especially, they need to kind of understand that. And I, I definitely don't want to change 40 buttons across all my wireframes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It just makes it so much easier. Yeah. To have that one. Okay. So I'm it also depends on if you are if you keep your wireframes or you evolve your wireframes. If you you know take your gray wireframes and then start adding colors and images to those in particular, then it totally makes sense to have your components at the very beginning. But if you you know if you keep your wireframes separately, maybe at the top of your canvas, and then you add you maybe you duplicate them, for example, maybe in that case you may not want to have those as components, but you know, it, it depends. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna change a couple things in here. So I'm just editing the hover state. Okay. I might change the colors later on, but luckily since it's a component, I can do that. That's true. Um, so I did see that you're adding a hover state and mm -hmm. what, what's the reasoning behind the hover state on a mobile application? That's a good point, actually. Um, so something that when I am designing for mobile, I also think of, am I going to be designing a desktop app as well right. or a tablet app? So I usually always just add in those hover states and select the states just so that I can have a consistent thing across. Even if it's for mobile, you won't really have um, a hover state. But yeah. I just like thinking that this could be a tablet experience mm -hmm. later on. I just like doing that early. It's an interesting point too, because uh, in addition to the desktop or you know web application that you were talking mm -hmm. about is now iPads have hover yep. states and support it. So if you're using iPad, I think it's iPad OS 13. Dot one or something like that, yeah. maybe 13.5, I don't know, there's too many versions, but they now support um, trackpads and mice and cursors. Right, and right exactly. With, yeah, with that, you can now hover over things, which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've, I've been wanting to get the iPad Pro and using it as like a, a third um, display. Yeah, so. I actually have your video on my iPad Pro right now. There it's great. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you don't, for a mobile, if you know that you're just creating a mobile app, you definitely don't need to have hover states um, yeah. until mobile screens become a, an extended display. But um, I like to do it just to have, just to have it in there as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I created a mess with the hover state. All right. Okay, so let's stay on this screen. So um, when you have a something that's oh, this got messed up. Let me quickly edit this. And while okay. you're doing that, I would love to hear from the chat uh, how all of you start your projects. Do you start with the wireframing frame? <laughs> Words are hard. Wireframing <laughs> phase, or do you just dive straight into high fidelity or something in between? Oh, and question. Annie is asking, do you usually design all of the device screens in one file or different files for mobile and desktop? And I'm going to add to that because, you know, the team is looking a lot at organization in Adobe XD. There's, mm -hmm. there's many solutions out there, but we're trying to figure out what the best solution is to offer to help with organization. So thinking about Annie's answer, yeah. Would there be something in Adobe XD that you would like to see to help you further organize your projects? So with mobile and desktop, it depends on how big the design is. So if I have like a hundred screens that I'm designing, I'll probably mm. have separate files for mobile and um, desktop yep. because you can link the design system between the two. Um, but what I've loved about having things as cloud documents is you're able to mark versions. Um, so I like to track my progression of my design with, without having multiple files. Like something I used to do is I would have 
I would save a file locally and have it for, you know, this was week one um, and then week two, just so I can keep track of the progression and be able to explain different decisions that I made. Yep. Um, but now that, you know, I save most things in the cloud, I can go ahead and mark, let's see if I can do it on here. I can just mark that version. Um, so like I had pre-design in here um, and then that'll just pop up at the top and I can go and actually look at that file again. Yeah, and I think that's one feature that some people don't know exists. They know cloud documents are a thing, but mm -hmm. you can. They also has versioning in it. So, like yeah. Julie mentioned, if you want to save, you know, week one, week two, week three, it's up there. Just hit that little down arrow and uh, go to town. Yeah, yeah. I definitely. I'm a big organization like geek in my normal life. So, figuring out the best way to organize files is is something I'm super interested in. But that's yeah. that's a way that I do it now. It's just I save versions, so I don't have to have multiple files for the same designs. Yeah. But if it's super big um, of a file, I'll probably have different versions for, for mobile and desktop. Okay. Yeah. And so, those are typically in, in different documents? Yeah. Yeah. But most of the time I have them within the same document because you can get pretty big. <laughs> right. As you can see. Yeah. Um, but I, I love having like the full... Like whenever I'm designing something, I like having my research pasted in there. And that's where something like Wireframe is, is nice as a plugin because you can just pull in um, those different frameworks. But it'll just, and even my mood board, I keep in here a lot. Um, I just like having them all in the same place. Yeah, and I know a lot of users are asking for pages in XD, and that's yeah. something the team is absolutely thinking about. Is that something that you would like to see? And, and if so, how would you like to see it laid out in XD? Yeah, I know I'm putting you on the spot. No, no, no. I have to. <laughs> I have to honestly play around a bit with pages, which I think it's in pages exist in Figma and Sketch. I'm not sure about Sketch, but I know Figma, right? Uh, I believe so. I think Sketch also has pages. Sketch also has it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, so far I haven't had a huge issue with keeping my files organized. Um, just because I have like a good folder structure as well within my. Um, create cloud as well as on my desktop like i usually save the files locally and on the cloud right um so i haven't run into a big need for pages yet but i've heard that a lot so i do want to see check out what people are doing with yeah. the eric, eric says i don't want the stupid pages from sketch um <laughs> there we and, go. and that's that's the challenge right it's yeah. it's one thing to say i want pages in adobe xd and, and trust me i would love some sort of better organization the, the challenge is how do we implement something like pages in XD? Yeah. Do we copy something that's from another application, which I don't think is the best solution because XD is different in a lot of ways, especially with components and states and, and um, things like that. And Eric says, I want bigger infinity space, which I, I would imagine he's talking about the canvas. So that's, the, that's what the team is kind of currently going through is yeah. we know we want better organization, how do we implement and, and and more importantly how does it interact with the rest of the document right mm -hmm. um so it's a challenge it's not as easy as it may se seem yeah yeah and I, I mean something i've loved about xd the whole i've been on the platform since i don't know 2017 when it was first came out um and i just love how simple it is you know a lot yeah. of apps out there are so complicated and hard to get into mm -hmm. and when you first look at xd you're like ah what is this what what can i do in here but then you start digging in and you're like wow i can do a lot um something yeah. i've heard a lot is like with things that are designed in xd you don't know that they're designed in xd whereas things designed with other platforms you know that it was designed in that platform so that's mm. i think a, a good distinction um but it's definitely been yeah i've i've really loved i really loved using it yeah um Okay, so the fun thing about components is I can just pull in if I want the same component, I just pull that in there. Um, someone mentioned on the chat that they find it challenging to visualize things with no color, and I feel the same way. Sometimes it's, I love bringing in, especially at this stage, like I love bringing in illustrations, which we'll do in tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, and start adding color and playing with color because it gives that character and helps me figure out like, you know, where do I need more? Where do I need less? So I totally agree with you on yeah, that one. Totally. And Diliana saying definitely the free space for designing is an issue in XD. 
it'd be great if it's larger. And yeah, I, I definitely agree. It'd be nice to have a bigger canvas. Uh, yeah. just totally, you know, components and states have certainly helped with that because you know, no, no longer need separate artboards for tiny little interactions. But if you are working on incredibly large projects like web designs or desktop designs, which are 1920 by 1080, sometimes even larger, then that could fill up a lot. And I know a larger canvas is something the team wants to get to. The, mm. the challenge with that, and there's, there's challenges with everything, is when you start increasing the canvas size and you start allowing for more uh, artboards, then that has the possibility of bringing down performance, which the team definitely wants to avoid. So they need to find that balance and they need to make sure that if they do increase the canvas, even if it's a little bit, that performance will not suffer. So all these things are on the top of the team's mind and yeah. some things are actively in the works. It's just they, they really need to make sure that performance doesn't suffer if the canvas size is increased or if pages are added or whatever it might be that they could be working on. Yeah. I totally agree because it's so awesome how you can just like even with 4k images in here you just zoom in and zoom out and there's no lag or anything yeah. like that so I like that um do people in the chat I'd love to know this like I always add these headers um within my within my artboard space I don't know mm -hmm. it's, it's like a galaxy basically <laughs> Um, but I, I always add these headers with me in here just so when I zoom out, I kind of can see what is within that section because sometimes I'll have hundreds of artboards and then I want to know if people do that within their artboards. Howard, do you do that? Ever? I do. I, I don't usually put them inside of artboards. I just kind of have them floating around. But oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah. 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 I like the, the no fill artboard. Yeah. Um, so with iOS. Um, you have a, when you go to enable location, I had designed this in a previous app, so I just pulled it in. Um, but I'm just prototyping, um, pulling in that little pop-up that says, will you allow the, like this app to use your location? Right. Um, I just like to do that like as I go. So I'm kind of going through the whole process right now. Yeah, but. so I just I just had to confirm this, just, just so I didn't say anything incorrectly. But yeah. one of the reasons that headers are, are kind of cool, in addition to being able to see them when you're zoomed out, is you know if they're on the pasteboard or if they're on a separate artboard and you just select the canvas, you can actually see those on the left-hand side in your layers panel. And then if you press Command-3, it basically zooms you straight to that section. Wait, say that again. Yeah, so go ahead and select one of the headers. Okay. Uh, and then command three and oh. it just yeah it just zooms you straight there so if you don't know where it is you can just select it in the, in the layers panel and then it just zooms you right there so is that a case for having the header within an artboard or is it just even if it's even yeah even if it's um just on the canvas oh cool yeah you just have the text layer which says let's say onboarding you just find that there and zoom okay. it right in that's a trick yeah. Another trick I learned of recently is with screenshots. So often I'll, um, you know, screenshot a photo of something um, to pull in to a design. So for example, I have a photo that I took on my desktop um, of my garden. Yeah. And if you do command shift four, so you're ready to do a screenshot and you hold control option command while you take the screenshot, it doesn't create like the file on your desktop or wherever it goes. Um, but it just copies it. So then you can just yeah. go and paste appearance. Did you, you yep. know that one? Yeah, I, I love I use that all the time. It's great. On that yeah. one. Yeah. Actually, before the stream, when we were setting things up and I showed you the screenshot of what whatever mm -hmm. what the overlay looks like, I used that same trick. I just copied it to the clipboard and pasted it directly in Slack. Yeah, I'll show an example of it just so we can see. But here's a photo of my banana peels going to be composted within my soil. So if I just get ready to screenshot this and I hold, you probably heard that little screenshot. Um, you hold those three buttons, then let's go to the learn section. I can just click in here and then click paste appearance and then it's automatically masked within there. Mm -hmm. So now this will be like my composting learn button. So yeah, that's the, I love using that trick. It's so much easier than yeah. before. Hey, Zeus is asking, when you have an image scroll, how do you fix the position of a graphic element? I know there's a menu called fix position when yep. scrolling, but I can't find the option in my Adobe XD. Oh. Image uh, scroll. Let's, 
an example. So it's, I think it's just put fixed position on scroll, right? I think that's what it's referring to. So let's- I'm assuming, I'm assuming that what it is, unless it's something different. It sounds like it could be something different based on the first, but that's why I'm, I'm like hesitating. But yeah, Julie will show where fixed position when scrolling is. Yeah, so let's bring and you have to keep in mind, um, this could be what Jesus is running into, that if the element you're selecting is part of a larger component or mask, it will not show up on the right. It has to be a parent component. So it has to, it can't be inside of something. Yeah, right. It has to be at the top. Um, yeah. So when I, I went ahead and grouped this um, bar over here, and then if you can see on the left in the layers panel, it's right at the top over here. And so when I go to prototype mode, I just see fixed position when scrolling. Um, and so let me expand my artboard so that you can see the actual scroll. I'm gonna do this one too, actually, while we're here, since that's the navigation bar. So now when I go to prototype, those two elements stay. So I probably, mm -hmm. I won't want, want this to actually stay. <laughs> right. Example. But the bottom navigation bar, that's like what I will do in my designs is have that fixed there. Yeah. Um, so just play around. It's probably the issue you're running into is where it is in the in the layers panel. Yeah. But good question. Okay. Wow, time is flying. We have I know. five minutes until portfolio reviews. Sorry. Right? Yep. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna want to add a and while you're doing that, one of the cool things for, for those who might be just joining, Julie is currently using what are called overlays in Adobe XD. And it allows you to add elements like this little modal, you know, uh, permissions modal, for example, to multiple artboards. And you, you don't have to, you know, have multiple duplicates of this instance. You can just have one of them on a single artboard and then basically pull it in to all the other ones on an action like a tap. So I'm just adding like a darkening piece to this so that when it overlays, oh, I'm gonna, I should make sure the size is right, but I can fix that later. Okay. There we go. There we go. Fancy. Now it's, there we go. And we can do the yeah. same thing for the next artboard um, for enabling but I'm just going to want to have to undo this. Senthil is asking which laptop is best for Adobe XD. Um, it's an interesting question. It's it's hard to really say which one is best. I mean, a lot of it depends on which operating system you prefer. I personally prefer Mac OS. A lot of people prefer Windows and XD does run great on both. I would say, you know, you probably don't need a ton of RAM, but 16 is probably what you want to aim for. 32 if you really want to be sure, but 32 might be a little bit overkill. Um, but yeah, honestly, many of the, the modern day laptops will run XD pretty well. Yeah, I like Mac as well for this, but I have used XD on a Windows um, machine before, and yeah. it works as well. So yeah, I have a um, one of those Microsoft Surfaces, and they want oh, they run nice. pretty well. Do you have the color dial? I really want one of those. <laughs> I do have one. Yeah, I don't know where it is. It's in a box somewhere, but I do have one. Yeah, it seems really awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I just changed it for the microphone as well. Um, and what's great about components is that, um, and I mean states, I can have multiple states within here. So I have the default state selected um, currently, but if I wanted to have the user on that overlay be able to click allow, um, I just have to edit the size a little bit because um, I changed it, but you can have that within there too. So you can have totally. multiple of those interactions in one. Okay, so I just wired up these and then the allow here. So if I go and edit the states. I'm gonna have to mess with the size a little later. You can also turn responsive resize off to um, avoid some of that. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I realized I had designed this before the pa like padding came out. Oh, um, right. Like this actual overlay, so I've, I've been meaning to go and edit it. Yeah, the team is also working on a few updates to components and states. One of those updates, I believe, is called Horizontal Sync. And that will allow things like resizing across the source component and the states to you know sync and also if you if you have like let's say hover effects right and you duplicate yeah. a component and you edit the text in one in the default state it'll also edit the text in the hover state as well so the, a lot of a lot of updates coming to components don't know exactly when those are coming but yeah something the team is actively working on oh nice i'm excited yeah okay so then this last screen is going to connect to um what is in this experience the home so it's going to be that voice assistant mm -hmm. um so i just wired up a bunch of a bunch of those things um and we'll go since we're running out of time we'll go a little bit um i'll edit those later on but this just brings us to our home screen and so um i'm gonna have a scroll within here so that we can have some learn content but i'm gonna pull in illustrations tomorrow so that we can have some some more character in there Nice. So the onboarding is pretty much done. I just have to edit the text and throw in those illustrations. Um, but all the wiring seems to be to be ready to go. I love it. All right, so we're gonna hop over. We're gonna hop over to us for a second. I am going to send you, Julie, the two portfolios that we're gonna review. Once you okay. receive those and open them up, we're gonna switch back over to your screen. Okay. The reason we're doing this is because there's a there's a, like a 15 second delay on the stream. So if Julia was watching the my screen on the Behance stream, it would be very awkward. So I'll just send that over to you. Uh, okay. I slacked it to you, so when you get it, pop okay. those open. Sounds good. And I would love to hear from the chat um, while Julie is doing this. If you, in a perfect world, if you can add one feature to Adobe XD to help you out in your designing. And don't say dark mode. <laughs> um, what would that one feature be? And what about you, Julie? What what one feature would you want to see in Adobe XD? I honestly would love to see um, like the video, like video playback. Okay, yeah. Uh, so that's something I've prototyped a lot like using after effects and, and things but um being able to have like videos or gifs play within my prototype yeah i want to do yeah That's and, and I, if i sound like a broken record it's definitely you know one of those things that the team is exploring and wants to get to video and gif support yeah it's also another one of those things that could bring down performance when you have moving videos or large yeah. gifs because some of those videos and gifs get like massively large and whenever yeah. you bring things like that into XD, even when you bring massively large images from Adobe stock, there's always the, the, the chance that if you have enough of them, performance would suffer. So when it yeah. comes to the videos and GIFs, that's just amplified by, I don't know, 100. So yeah. performance, well, yeah, you know. The question of performance versus the actual feature. Yeah, and yeah. whether it's worth it, I know. I mean, luckily you can get away um, with doing it using multiple apps, Adobe apps together. So mm -hmm. for now, like I'm not blocked from doing that, which is nice. Um, but yeah, it's thinking about like the future. Um, if we can master the performance, that would be an awesome feature. Yeah, there's also yeah. the Anima plugin, which was yes. recently released that allows you to add in a video. It just basically shows a placeholder. And then when you preview that prototype on Anima's website, it would, it would play the video. So it's a little bit of a, an extra step in there, but it's something that you can do in the meantime. Yeah, a lot of people in the chat are talking about um, linking videos. So yeah. putting in a video and be able to link out to something else. That's super mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. That makes sense. I was, I was prototyping a um, text-based, like kind of like an AI chatbot, um, which there's a lot of links within that. Um, right. And so having, being able to prototype it actually opening up. You can use auto-animate, but it doesn't actually show um, the live website. So yeah, yeah, video is a big, a big one in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I agree. Um, so we're on Behance. All right, right now. So I think we're gonna check out the the daily creative challenge. Is that right? Sure. Let's let you cool. go through them. So, so this is um before we dive into that one. Uh, this is Anmol. Yes. Looks like he's uh he or she. It looks like a I can't see from there. Um, is a student. 
and yep. there's a little bit of a bio at the bottom. What I would say, and I say this a lot, is when you're building out your Behance portfolio, especially if you want to attract clients, really expand in that bio section. You know, tell us a lot about you, who you are, um, what you do for a living currently, if you're a student, where you're studying, if, if you want to reveal that information, of course, what kind of designer you are, what kind of designer you want to be, who you've worked with before. You know, clients love seeing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like that about me section, I don't remember how big you can get with it, but put in a little paragraph, you know, people love to um, feel like they're talking to you, even if yeah. it's just an online portfolio. Yep. Um, so definitely that's a good way to like start with a good first impression is like telling us a little bit, a little bit more about yourself. Totally. But overall also like, don't worry about like the followers and following and things like that on Behance. Like it's all about your work and that's what's there to showcase what you could do. So yeah. Let's check it out. Okay, so we have a bunch of projects in here, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Looks like some logo branding stuff and then some websites. And then I think they said that they are starting out in UX. Welcome. Nice. Okay, so poster design challenge. So, oh, with Julia. So Julia was on the chat. I don't know if she's still here, but this was your daily creative challenge. Um, so I think it's posters. Do we want to do a... A UX one hour, maybe sure. this one. Yeah. Since we're on the UX live stream. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Rome home. Okay. So we have like a nice graphic at the top here. Kind of looks like it could be like Airbnb. -esque. It does look like that. Yeah. I'm based on the name. It probably it's probably in that direction. And I love uh, projects that start off with a nice big header image at the top that shows kind of what we're going to be getting into. Yeah. It's like a hook into yeah. an essay. Um, okay, so Roam Home provides a dual service, one to the homeowner and then holiday homeowner. So yeah, it looks like it's a short-term rental um, website or app. Mm -hmm. So renting out your home on platforms like Airbnb can be rewarding yet time-consuming. Okay, so it looks like we're trying to solve for um, problems that Airbnb and websites like that are having. Okay, yeah, that's that's an interesting challenge because Airbnb is obviously a massive giant, and um, you know, coming up with with solutions that ch uh, solve for some of those challenges are it's it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we go into fonts, so and colors. So one thing I would recommend. So once you're you know opening up with. Um, what the problem is or the overview of your solution. You don't want to have a, a gap um, before you get into how you got to that solution. So with things like visual design, um, so things like fonts and colors, I would recommend having that a little bit later on um, after you get through like the meat of the case study. Mm. And I'm sure you go into it a little more, but yeah, you get into the design here. Um, I would recommend flipping that. So putting the design up right after you talk about um, what you you know, solved, and then having those visual design elements um, a little later on. Yep, it's good feedback. This looks great. What are your thoughts on? You know, there's there's definitely a lot here. There's there are a lot of screens. Do you think yeah. there are too many screens? Too little screens? Are they spaced out enough? So there are definitely a lot of screens, yeah. um, which is good because you're showing like breadth of what you can do. But with case studies, especially, I think it's it's great to talk about people want to see, especially like, you know, companies that are hiring, they want to see your process and getting there and the mm -hmm. decisions that you made for each of those um, experiences. So I would pick a few and sometimes you can also have um, like GIFs playing of your prototype and so you can get multiple screens just in one in one right. um, view box. So. I would recommend choosing like the main elements of this experience. So for example, um, the search page would be one that I can see and then actually booking would be another one. The discover perhaps. Yeah, I, I would also try to prioritize the screens and designs that solve the problem. Because obviously, you know, for this particular example, the, the idea is to solve problems that Airbnb might have, right? And looking at some of these screens that are in this gallery section, a lot of it looks like Airbnb already. So as I'm browsing this website, I'm having a hard time understanding what's being solved here. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that's where going through the problem. I know we talked about before, like the problem of having too much text and explaining too much, but you also don't want the opposite where you don't explain much at all. Right. Yeah. Um, so finding that right balance of explaining what you are, what are those specific problems that in this case, Airbnb is having that you're solving for, and then the solution that you came up with for that. Um, yeah, I so yeah, I think just a few more details um, within, you know, pick five screens and then um, talk about what those details are and what problem each of those had solved. Yeah, and design wise, it looks pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. You have some nice photos in here. Just zooming in. Um, amenities, facilities. Yeah, I think, I mean, design wise, it's things are, are laid out well. Um, you know, you have consistent imagery within mm -hmm. there and consistent style. Wow, that's a cool house. <laughs> this <laughs> Casa Bonita one. Um, and then you have Instagram in there, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, I think I think the biggest feedback is just um, condensing it down a little more and focusing on, on what those screens are yeah. that are solving the problem. And then it looks like responsiveness. So I don't know what responsiveness for this section. Oh, oh, it's four different screen sizes. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah, I can see that there. Yeah, and for yeah, things think... like that, just to make sure that people who are scrolling know exactly what they're looking at, it could be as simple as just adding a subheader. So you have responsiveness as the header, and then underneath, you can have something like, looks great on all devices, or something like that, just to really tell people that that's what response, because responsiveness could mean a lot of different things. Yeah. And also with that, think about like, why do you have that section? You know, so for this, for example, people are going to be on the go. They might have be using a mobile tablet. They might be mm -hmm. using a laptop. So you are designing for multiple screens for a reason, but some apps might not be mobile based because of the problem that you're solving. Um, so that's good to always explain to um, and, and ask yourself, like, do I need this section and what is it solving for? Totally. Yeah. Cool. And then colors wise, you go through that. Um, I like to sometimes have, if you have a set of illustrations, you can call out whether you design them yourself or if you had an illustrator, sometimes that's that's fun, especially if you do design your own illustrations. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can you can throw that in there too. Yeah, for these ones, I, I, I do notice that they, uh, I believe it's an undraw, undraw illustration. Yeah, I, I have used say, that in the past. It looks like it, yeah. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know on Draw, it's basically an open source illustration library. Um, so you can edit everything like the colors and the layout um, of all of those illustrations. And they have a ton of different scenes out there. So you can check that out. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's take a quick look at one more from uh, Amol. Yeah. Cool, okay. Amol. Let's go to Sorry. this one. Sure. The creative challenge. Okay. Okay, so great, you have the challenge prompt in here. So design a personal finance experience that rewards user meeting users meeting their goals. And then use auto animate. Was this an Andrea one? I think so, it might have been. It looks like her style. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've we've um started to adopt her templates because they're just so amazing yeah. and they've yeah. just made my life so e easy. Yeah, definitely. No, I know her Behance page is like perfectly curated uh -huh. out. It's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna just scroll through first so we can get an overview of everything and then we'll jump back to the top. So we've got a few screens in here. Oh, and then you have a prototype. Nice. Nice. All right, so that was a quick view of the prototype. All so right, so that. right off the bat, I do have a little bit of feedback. I'm just gonna zip through it because we do want to get to the next portfolio. Yeah. So um, the the white text on the green background, a little bit difficult to see. If you're thinking about accessibility, um, it may not, it probably won't pass. So I would I would work on that a little bit, either change the green to a darker green or use a darker text, for example. I do see over to the right in the collection section, there's there are some dark borders around those buttons. May not necessarily be necessary. 
Um, so you, you probably want to get rid of those. And then uh, there was something else that caught my eye. Where well, was it? The icons are pretty different. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's um, what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I think finding you can find an icon kit that has a bunch of different icons that have the same style yeah. and use that. Um, but just make sure that like visually they look consistent across the three of them. Yeah. That's and it. there was one section that had two buttons. I think one was green. One was that one there. The buttons are different sizes, which yeah. could be very confusing. So I would just streamline that, make them the same size. It's good you have two different colors but mm -hmm. definitely, you know, streamline those buttons so they're more consistent. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I agree with Howard with the with the borders as well. Sometimes you don't need them. If you want to try, you can play with drop shadows even, um, but it looks like you, you might not even need them in there. Yeah. So, cool. And then um, it looks like you have your little preview. You can just, you can also create, you can create a GIF once you record your screen um, of, you know, there's some online converters that you can convert a video into a GIF and that you can just plug directly into Behance so you don't have like a, a video portal that pops up. Um, that's something that you can do as well. Yeah, and one more thing you can do is when you're sharing under the share tab in XD, when you publish a link, you can actually copy the embed code and embed that directly on Behance so people can actually click through your entire portfolio. Yeah, sweet. Okay, shall we go to the next? Yeah, let's go to Ash's portfolio, and Ash is in the chat. Awesome, and great job, and all. Okay, so now we are on Ash. Okay, so Ash is also from India, and we've got a little more information here. So, yes, art and D. I'd love to learn what that is. That sounds cool. Mm. Um, so creativity and simplistic design for everyone currently in the last year of university. Okay, so we know nice. you're a student. Um, you usually work on UX design, logos, graphics, and you can speak English and Korean. That's Ooh, awesome. fancy. Yeah. Um, you have your email, which is great. Um, and then Adobe Live Behance, you've been featured, and here you are again. That's awesome. Um, okay. Let's see, Howard, do you have any comments on the bio Behance page? I think it's good. I think it's definitely, it goes into a little bit of detail. Um, it looks like you have ES Art, ES Art and D possibly, uh, who you've possibly worked with or worked for or whatever you do. Um, I would also include that in the bio if you've worked for other companies or you've done client work, throw that in there as well. Um, just kind of adds to your experience so that you seem a little bit more legit, right? Yeah. And if you have like a separate portfolio website too, like if you don't just use Behance, I would always recommend throwing that in there too. Yeah. Um, just for having wherever your work shows up, throw that in your Behance as well. Yep. And yeah, you got featured on Behance with XD and interaction channels, which is awesome. So we won't go through that one since you've been featured, which is great. But let's go through maybe this 10 minute design challenge. Sure. Check that out. Okay. This is cool. You only yeah, have 10 minutes. It's an interesting to... style. Have to complete within 10 minutes using only two colors and keeping it minimal. That's okay. Fun. Okay. So you go through day one, create a piece of communication that gets the stay at home message across. This could also include the social distancing advice as well. Okay, so this is related to COVID. Mm -hmm. Don't rent a hope. Okay. Oh, okay. So these graphics on the left here that you created in 10 minutes. Yeah. Sweet. And then don't run to the toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> 2020, that's just that the icon terrible. for 2020. It's just a roll of toilet paper. Roll of toilet paper. <laughs> um, yeah, the need to shop responsibly. And then day three. Okay, so it was like a full week long challenge. Um, create, a printer, create a fresh and unusual logo. That looks cool. Oh, so Ash says the first one is two people looking outside. Oh. Okay. Okay. I didn't get that. I kind of thought it had to do with like a, it almost looked like a UFO. Yeah. Right? And but I now the, see the, the virus. So they're looking outside and I think it's that, that's the virus up there. Ah, I got it. Okay. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. It's fun how in 10 minutes you come up with a concept and then like quickly create it. 
it is so um, difficult to do something in 10 minutes because yeah, sometimes yeah. just the just the idea takes hours and hours of research i know yeah and even just like messing around with um like making sure that these lines are consistent across this toilet paper looks great yeah <laughs> like in 10 minutes that's awesome mm -hmm. very very good job um don't be in a circle be in a square i wonder what that is supposed to mean Ash, tell us what that distance one means. And, okay, I, I think I get it. So it's like social distancing, maybe? Okay. Possibly. So like not being in crowds. Mm. Okay, stretch your body, not the virus. Very important. I like the uh, the little icon, the stretcher on the far left. It. it really looks like it has a bit of motion to it. Yeah, yeah. I love that with the... Um, the change in the handicap sy uh, symbol many mm. years ago, um, when it went from kind of a still image to a like moving image, it was like a yeah. very empowering um, shift that's super important. So yep. it kind of gives a similar flow um, where it's like a dynamic icon, which I, I really agree. like. Okay. Oh, this is cool. All right, so you've got a bunch of different ones. This was a long challenge, 10 days. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, I, love, um, I love the little Game Boy and the, the beer icons. Yeah. We need a Nintendo Switch in there. <laughs> yeah. Those have been hard to come by this, this I know. Spring, which is crazy. I just got one last Oh, week. really? I'm super excited. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> anyway, it took a long, long time to get one, but... Yeah, a few of my friends have been trying to find one, and it's been difficult. Yeah. And of course, you know, they don't want to pay five or six hundred dollars to get right. one from a scalper. Exactly. I know. Yeah. So it's like you just have to wait for the right moment when it, it's in stock. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's do a UX project as well. Um, so we can do, Howard, which one do you want to do? Should we go through yep. the ice one or a different one? Uh, the one you clicked on looked pretty good. This possibly. One? Okay. Cool. So this is from 2019 during an internship at Hyper. Okay. So that's a great intro. Ooh. Um, so you just like give, you know, that this was an intern project they worked on. Mm -hmm. um, you can even link out to the company that you worked at. That's sometimes yeah. helpful. Now, is that the hyper? Oh, it is. It's Is that hyperlink? Like the boring company? Elon Musk? Oh, it looks like it. Yeah, I would love to, just because I'm a nerd and I love all the things Elon's doing, it, I would love to know what you've done, what you did. Maybe you'll get to it a little bit further down, but I would love to know what you did specifically at um, hyperlink. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That's a super interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you'll probably go into that too, but it looks like, um, so this card size is piece. I'm not exactly sure what you did within here. Um, so like it could be a before and after it could be, I don't know, Howard, what do you think? It's hard to tell, but it could be, um, oh, Ash says it's a local company. Okay. Um, okay. So it, maybe it's just revolving around the boring company and hyperlink and things like that. But um, it could just be var uh, variations on these cards. But mm -hmm. I would, yeah, like you said, I would love to know more about this, what these cards are used for. Um, yeah. Just, yeah. Just and really add, explain Yeah, it. like you said, um, since it's a local company, just add a little more details um, just so you don't confuse people and set up a different expectation on what they should be looking for. Because um, it could be something totally different. So yeah, just do a little more of an intro, I'd say, in the beginning. Yeah. And okay, so Ash it. says they are different sized cards for different resolutions. Got it, okay. Cool, okay, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so we're in the admin app portion. Okay, so like we mentioned before with the last portfolio, I think talking about in the beginning what problem you're solving for will help set the stage for the whole case study. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with the admin app in here, what what were what problem were you solving for? Like have a little description box um, at the top of that section to explain each of those. Yep. And it looks like he'll update that in there. Okay. And then let's see. We have a chat dashboard account. Yeah, it's so hard I to think... tell from from this, you know, being zoomed out like this. But um, the the icons look a little bit difficult to see. You know, I love using line base icons, but sometimes if you're if they're not thick enough, they can be they can kind of get lost in the navigation bar. Yeah, 
yeah, you can just make them a little bigger too. Um, yeah. And it depends, you know, accessibility wise, it's important to have um, the names of each of those icons, but if they're extremely self-explanatory, sometimes you don't need them. Yeah. Um, but general rule of thumbs, it, it is nice to have the, those descriptions which you, you've gotten there. Totally. So we have about a minute left. Okay. Let's take a quick look at the rest. Yeah. So I think colors wise, you could add some some fun colors in there, but that's that's just me. I love adding mm -hmm. fun colors. Um, this looks great. So it looks like some wire framing. Um, so you have like placeholders for images, and you show where they connect. I like um, that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great for being able to see. And then if you have an interactive prototype, you can throw that in there too. Eventually. Yeah. So. Totally. Cool. All righty. Hey. So that's going to wrap it up for today. If you didn't get your portfolio reviewed, we will definitely be reviewing portfolios uh, probably later in the week, and if not, definitely next week. So stay tuned for that. Tomorrow we are going to be reviewing daily creative challenges. And Julie, what are you going to be tackling tomorrow? Yeah, so we have a lot to do tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll be going into, I'm going to go and um, add in some more visual elements, and then we'll go and do a lot more um, prototyping tomorrow. So um, we'll use auto animate a lot. We'll probably throw in some voice in there um, and just get it to a fully you know, developed hi-fi prototype tomorrow. Awesome, that sounds fun. Stay All right, everyone. everyone. Where, where can people find you before they go? Um, so I am on Instagram at Julie Sandusky. So just use my name in the title. Um, and then um, Behance, I'm on there as well. My name is the same across the internet. So I'll be on there. Awesome. That sounds good. All right, everyone. Big thank you to everyone who have tuned in today and stick around in just a few minutes. We have, we've got Andrea coming up with another daily creative challenge. Should be a lot of fun. She runs some fantastic challenges. So stick around for that. And we will be back tomorrow with more goodness. Awesome. Thanks everyone. See you tomorrow. See you later.